Hey, hello. Welcome to everyone who's joining us today uh, to learn with Torah in Motion about Rosh Chodesh. Um, my name is Lori Novik. Just to introduce myself, I am a veteran Yoetzet Halacha, uh, trained by Nishmat. I've been doing that for about 16 years. And I'm also director of a website about women in mitzvot called derecheha.org, um, from which some of this material is drawn because we've done some work talking about the nature of Rosh Chodesh in particular, insofar as it's often called a holiday for women. Okay, so what I want to do today is to start talking about what Rosh Chodesh is. I want to look at different sources, starting with biblical sources and then moving forward into, into sources from Torah Sheba Al Peh. And the central question that's going to animate what we do is the question of, on some level, what makes a holiday a holiday? And what distinguishes Rosh Chodesh from other days? On some level, we're very used to Rosh Chodesh. We experience it every month. But the question is, if we really experience it in its fullness as it's intended to be, how easy is it for us to recognize Rosh Chodesh as being in any way different from other days? Okay, before we continue, I'm gonna, I just wanna check, please just uh, sign in the chat if you, if you have any problem hearing, if someone's having any trouble hearing me or seeing me, please just write it up in the chat. And then um, I wanna try to share a screen so that we can look at a couple of sources together as well. Okay, all right, great. So far, so good. Seder, let's get started. And the first source I wanna look at with you, let's see if the share screen is going to work. Okay, uh, share screen. I want to share this. Yes, share. Okay. Okay. Um, okay, here we are. The first source I want to share with you comes from the Kuzari. The Kuzari, the Sefer Kuzari by Rav Yehuda Halevi, is a dialogue in between, between a king who is trying to determine where real religious truth is to be found, and a Jew who guides him and shares with him the wisdom of our people in our Torah. And Rosh Chodesh, to the best of my knowledge, only comes up one time in all of Sefer Kuzari, and it's in a passage that I find particularly meaningful. So let's look at it together. Here's Sefer Kuzari 3.5. He, first, he's talking about prayer. The context here is beforehand, he was talking a little bit about what the experience of prayer is, and he continues. Those three times of daily prayer are the fruit of his day and night, and the Sabbath is the fruit of the week, because it has been appointed to establish the connection with the divine spirit and to serve God in joy, not in sadness, as has been explained before. All this stands in the same relation to the soul as food to the, as food to the human body. I want to stop here for a second because it's already a rather profound thought. By the way, for those of you who are wondering why I'm not using the Hebrew, it's just because the original original, the Hebrew translation is a classic by Shmuel Ibn Tibon, but the original original is not written in Hebrew. So once we're using a translation, we'll go straight to the English. Um, the profound idea that we've already seen is this. The Kuzari is telling us to start with that prayer is not just an exercise in serving God. Prayer is also fundamentally a form of sustenance for the Jew. When we pray, we feed ourselves, we create ourselves. Prayer is a resource for us. And now what he's added, which is fascinating, is to say that prayer in this resource is somehow also going to be connected in a different way to the cycles of Shabbatot. In other words, there's three times a day during which we pray. And we get the same way we would eat a few times a day. We're praying a few times a day. We're feeding our body with food and we feed our soul with prayer. But then there's something extra that's coming at Shabbatot. So let's see where he goes with this. All this stands in the same relation to the soul as food, as food to the human body. Prayer is for his soul, for a person's soul, what nourishment is for his body. The blessing of one prayer lasts till the time of the next, just as the strength derived from the morning meal lasts till supper. In other words, we're extending the metaphor it is not just that prayer sustains or feeds us. It's more than that. The same way we hunger 
from meal to meal and the hunger builds as we get closer and closer to our next meal time so too from prayer session to prayer session the soul slowly but surely feels that its spiritual hunger starts to grow until it prays again the further his soul is removed from the time of prayer the more it is darkened by coming in contact with worldly matters the more so as necessity brings it into the company of youths, uh, this is, I enjoy particularly women or wicked people. Of course, women in the day of Rav Yehuda Levi on the whole, were not going to be very well educated. So perhaps he was skeptical that he was going to have meaningful interactions with women he would typically meet. When one hears unbecoming and soul darkening words and songs, which exercise an attraction for his soul, which he is unable to master. So when we're going through these times, and I can't help but thinking, and we'll get back to it, about the coronavirus times we're in. When we're going through these times when the things that give us spiritual sustenance are not constantly there, there are things that distract us, and we long and need something more. During prayer, he purges his soul from all that passed over it, and prepares it for the future. According to this arrangement, there elapses not a single week in which both his soul and body do not receive preparation. Darkening elements have increased during the week. They cannot be cleansed except by consecrating one day to service and to physical rest. Of course, what's that going to, day going to be? Shabbat. The body repairs on the Shabbat the waste suffered during the six days and prepares itself for the work to come while the soul remembers its own loss through the body's companionship. He cures himself, so to speak, from a past illness and provides himself with a remedy to ward off any future sickness. So in Rav Yehuda Alevi's picture, during the, over the course of the day, much as I need to go from meal to meal, I go from prayer to prayer, and over the course of the week, something builds up and I need a more intense encounter with God. And that intense encounter with God, both so that my body can rest from work and so that my soul can, as it were, be purified, comes with Shabbat. Now, as you might imagine, we're going to build to Rosh Chodesh. First, he references Job, Eov. Eov, on a weekly basis, would bring sacrifices for his children unless they had sinned, which is also a weekly cycle of purification. But then he says, he then provides himself with a monthly cure, which is the season of atonement for all that happened during this period, i.e. during the duration of the month and the daily events. As it is written, thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. So what Rav Yehuda Alevi is saying is that we have our daily cycle from prayer to prayer, we have our weekly cycle from Shabbat to Shabbat. And then the soul gets fed as well on a monthly cycle, which is more intensified in some sense than Shabbat. It's something extra. And that becomes Rosh Chodesh. The role of Rosh Chodesh, the way Rabbi Yehuda Levi is conceiving it, is as a stepping stone, an additional measure that's taken once a month to feed beyond the weekly cycle of Shabbatot can bring. And then he adds, to put it in context, that it's here with the festivals. He further attends the three festivals and the great fast day, i.e. Yom Kippur, on which some of his sins are atoned for, and on which he endeavors to make up for what he may have missed on the days of those weekly and monthly cycles. Okay, so what do we have here? I'm gonna to try to get back to um, the meaning and not the share, here we go, I'm back to the meaning. So what do we have here? We have a conception of Rosh Chodesh as a type of monthly boost or food for the soul beyond what our daily or weekly regimens can possibly bring. Now, what basis in Torah is Rav Yehuda Levi building on to conceive of Rosh Chodesh that way? And also, is it natural to think of Rosh Chodesh that way, given that Rosh Chodesh isn't quite like a festival, and in fact, isn't really quite like a Shabbat, okay? So those are questions that we are going to want to look at right now. Let's start by looking at um, some, additional, some additional sources. I'm gonna to try to share the screen again, okay? Yeah, share. 
Okay, let's start looking at some of the biblical sources about Rosh Chodesh. Start here, and this, of course, is what we just read in Parshat Chodesh, and it's the it's particularly significant to us now in the lead up to Rosh Chodesh Nisan. God said to Moshe, Aaron and to Aaron, in the land of Egypt, saying, The first mitzvah that's given to the Jewish people as a whole is sanctifying the month. This month will be for you, the head of the months, i.e. Nisan is the first of all the months. Rishon hu lechem l'chodshashana. There, of all the months, this is the one that's going to come first. We're always going to count our months from Nisan, even if our years begin with what we call now Rosh Hashanah. Now, there's no indication here really of what Rosh Chodesh itself signifies. That comes later. Rosh Chodesh seems to just signify that it starts the month. We can't tell from the verse in Shemot what significance inherently it has as a day. In the Midbar, however, we start to fill out the picture a little bit. Of Yom Simchatchem, of Moadechem, we're in source number two, of Roshei Chodshechem, Utkatem Bechatzotzrot Alalotechem, Valzivchei Shomechem, Vayulachem Nezikaron Lifnei Alokechem, Ani Hashem Alokechem. On the day of your rejoicing and on your appointed festivals and on your Roshei Chodashim, you will blow the trumpets over your burnt offerings and over your peace offerings, and they will be for you a remembrance before God, I am the Lord, your God. Now, here we really see very clearly that Rosh Chodesh is being grouped with the festive days. Yom Simchatchem Uvmoadechem. Rosh Chodesh here is being described as a day of rejoicing, and it's being described as being like the appointed times. It doesn't seem like it counters an appointed time, though the fact is that there's a Gemara in Pesachim which actually calls Rosh Chodesh explicitly a Moed. Okay, still beyond the rejoicing, what else is going to characterize Rosh Chodesh? Well, source number three, the Midbar Kafchet, Uvroshei Chodeshechem Takrivu Ola, Zot Ola Chodesh Bechodesho Lechodesh There's a special burnt offering that's going to be brought on Rosh Chodesh. And we also, we know about the, on the whole, we have the Musaf offerings. Rosh Chodesh is among the ones with the Musaf offerings. Now there's something that's interesting that happens in the Musaf offering of Rosh Chodesh. Now there's gonna be a single male goat that's going to be brought as a single offering. Here's the thing though, for God, upon the burnt offering, that in a salvation, this is happening on Rosh Chodesh. It's typical for us to have a sin offering as part of a Musaf offering. What's unique is the description on Rosh Chodesh of that sin offering as being a sin offering for God. It's strange to say a sin offering for God because of course, God doesn't sin. What on earth could that possibly mean? Well, there's a long Gemara in Masechet Chulin that starts to spell it out. Um, we're not going to read all of it. Well, actually, you know, we'll go through it very quickly. It's, it's actually, it's quite fascinating. And it starts to give us an idea of the way in which the Gestalt of Rosh Chodesh is different Okay, and it says that there's a great light and there's a small light. Don't worry, we're going to get from here to the offering of Rosh Chodesh. The moon said before God, Could two kings possibly share the same crown? What's the idea? The moon apparently was not satisfied with being described as one of two co-equal lights at the beginning of creation. What does God say? Go and minimize yourself, he says to the moon, make yourself small. The moon says to God, 
I mean, that that's me. I said to you something that was logical, that we can't have two co-equal lights leading the day the same way that you can't have really two kings working in parallel. For that, I should be punished and made smaller. God says to her, Lechi umshal bayom uvalayla. Go and take command of the day and the night. What does he mean by that? Well, we can see the moon sometime also during the day. Amrle, she says, my rabute, I'm not going to be able to give any real benefit by giving light during the day. He says, Go, don't worry. The people of Israel are going to count their days by you. So the moon has been diminished on the one hand. And on the other hand, the moon becomes the basis on which we're going to order our time. Amrale, the moon says to him, Yomanami, Ishardzalomanu Beit Kufota. He says, wait a minute, I'm not really going to get the days all by myself. The sun's going to be there. The sun's involved in the tukufot, in the seasons. And in, it, it's not just going to be a lunar calendar. And in fact, it's true. We have a combined calendar. We have a lunar and solar calendar, right? The main calendar is lunar, and we make corrections for the solar calendar. And then what does God say? Something quite remarkable. He says, Zil, go, Ligrut Sadiki Bishmech. May the righteous be called in your name, Moon. Yaakov Katan, Shmuel Katan, David Katan. The righteous are again and again called the small. On the one hand, the moon, the moon was not satisfied with having co-leadership. God says, okay, then I'll shrink you. We won't have co-leaders, you'll be smaller. The moon's still not satisfied, again and again, raising objections to the way that Hashem has responded. And God finally, first, at this stage, rather, not final, but at this stage, God says something that's very important for us. He's already said that the moon is going to determine how we're measuring our months. But now he's added another point. And the other point is that the things that are small in Judaism often have an outsized impact. In fact, Many of the commentaries the Agada, of the, on the Agada to here take the moon as being a symbol for the Jewish people as a whole. The Jewish people as a whole has often been throughout history a sort of underdog. And the moon, in its waxing and waning, and the fact that it's not as constantly shining in as obvious a way or dominant a way as the sun, in some ways represents the Jewish people and our persistence and our significance, even though it's not always immediately apparent just how powerful we are. And what's particularly interesting to me here is the way in which this parallels some of our thinking about Rosh Chodesh. Rosh Chodesh is of course the holiday that marks what the moon is meant to do to govern in particular the months. And Rosh Chodesh is simultaneously extremely significant and yet, in a certain way seems smaller. For we just saw Rosh Chodesh is showing up there in the Torah. It's a day of rejoicing. It has a special sacrifice. And yet Rosh Chodesh does not have all of the evident, obvious, bigger trappings of other sacred days. Now, here's where we get to the end about Rosh Chodesh. God sees that he was not in fact able to satisfy the moon's wishes or to calm her down. Amar Kadesh Baruch Hu says, Haviu kapara alai shemiyatati atayarech. Bring an atonement on my behalf that I made the moon small. Now on the one hand, God is not actually saying that he sinned. And God is also not taking back his decision about what should happen to the moon. And yet at the same time, he's saying, there's going to be a gesture every month built into the sacrifice that marks the day of the moon that's most significant, that also is a gesture of my acknowledging to the moon that there was a change that was made here. So even here, we have this tension between Rosh Chodesh and its great significance and the ways in which, like the moon, it can sometimes seem comparatively insignificant. Now, where else do we see Rosh Chodesh in the Torah and Tanakh? Well, Yeshayahu tells us that actually, in fact, 
Ve'aya or halavana ke'or hachama, that the day is going to come when the light of the moon is going to be just like the light of the sun. And Rav Chaim Vital takes this a step further. He talks about the masculine and feminine elements in Kabbalah and says, in fact, those will be equal. And this has become a popular agadita, in particular in uh, women's circles, to mention, to try to talk about some of the changes that we've seen between women and men and what the status of women in now is nowadays. Now, more significantly, we have sources in Sefer Malachim that tell us that Rosh Chodesh indeed was considered often enough to be in some ways tantamount to or similar to Shabbat. We have the story of the Shunamit. Now, her son has just collapsed and she is desperate for help to be brought to him so that he can survive. And she goes to confront or to seek help from Elisha because he is, of course, the one who promised her that she'd be able to have a son to start with. And now when she's in her race to go seek out this man of God, she says she's going on her way and her husband sees her and he says, He says, wait, why are you going today? Today is not Rosh Chodesh and it's not Shabbat. What we learn from here is that in fact, back in the day, Rosh Chodesh was treated in some ways like a Shabbat. If there would be a day in which a person would go to seek out a man of God, that day would be Rosh Chodesh, not just Shabbat. People would seek out the man of God on a weekly cycle. And also, sort of like what the Kuzari said as a supplement, seek out the man of God on a monthly cycle. And because of the repetition month to month, it's something that's clear enough in her husband's mind that he can ask her about. Okay, let's talk about performing work on Rosh Chodesh because if we think about the major distinction we have between Rosh Chodesh and Shabbat, the major distinction really is that on Rosh Chodesh, we perform malacha, and on Shabbat, we don't. Now, what's interesting is to see within Tanakh suggestions of how that might have been different when we did in fact bring sacrifices on Rosh Chodesh. Yechezkel says, Ko amar Hashem Elohim, shar chatzer ha-pnimit ha-pona kadim yesagur sheshet yimei ma'ase, uv'yom ha-shabat yipatach, uv'yom ha-chodesh yipatach, v'shtachavu am ha-aretz petach ha-shar hu b'shabatot uv'chodashim l'pnei Hashem. It's not just to go out to seek the man of God that we see Rosh Chodesh being singled out as being like Shabbat. Here Yechezkel is telling us that worship in Beit HaMikdash, for example, would be different on Rosh Chodesh, and that that would be a time when people would gather at Beit HaMikdash in order to serve God, in addition to the week to week and in addition to the festivals, when everyone would come. And indeed, in Yeshayahu it says, And it will be that each and every month and each and every Shabbat, all flesh will come to worship before me. So Rosh Chodesh we've already seen marked as a day of rejoicing in the Torah. It's got a sacrifice. And we've also seen that it's singled out alongside Shabbat as a day in which we would go to seek counsel or to just gather around or learn from a man of God. And also a day in which we would have special worship gatherings, in particular in Beit HaMikdash. What about performing labor? Well, a clue about performing labor comes from the story of David and Yonatan. David needs to run away from Shaul, who is preparing to pursue him and perhaps even kill him. In order to do that, his running away is going to be facilitated by his close friend, son of Shaul, Yonatan. And there's a particular concern that Yonatan has, which is that when Rosh Chodesh comes, it's going to be clear to Shaul that David has run away because that's a day on which everyone gathers together. Source 13, Vayomer lo Yonatan, 
מחר חודש. ונפקדת כי יפקד מושביך. And Yonatan says to David, Now listen, tomorrow is Rosh Chodesh, and you're going to be noticed or remembered or missed. Ki paked moshavecha, because your seat is going to be remarked upon. There's going to be an empty seat at the table. This tells us another aspect of Rosh Chodesh, which is that there would be formal feasting on Rosh Chodesh. And now, what does he say? On the third day, you're going to go down far, and you're going to come to where you hid on, and here's our key word, on your day of doing. And then you're going to hide, as it were, by the stone of Ezel, your day of doing. What has Yonatan just done? He's told us that there is a contrast. There's a contrast between tomorrow, which is Chodesh or Rosh Chodesh, and the day of doing, Biyom Hamaaseh. We could infer from this contrast that Rosh Chodesh is not a day of doing. And indeed, Radak, Rav David Kimchi, prominent biblical commentator, does just that. It would appear that the custom was that no one did malacha on Rosh Chodesh. We'll talk about this soon, as is a woman's custom of today. And it's possible that because of the Korban Rosh Chodesh, a lot of people were free from work. They were busy with the korban. That might be similar to what we talk about when we talk about korban Pesach. Yud Dalid of Nisan, there's a discussion about performing malacha on Yud Dalid of Nisan and what its status is as a sacred day. And one of the reasons why, in fact, malacha might even have been prohibited in some places all day of the 14th of Nisan is because the Korban Pesach was brought on the 14th of Nisan and people were occupied with their sacrifice. So Radak is taking that idea and he's applying it to Rosh Chodesh. He says, look, I can make an inference. I can draw an inference from the use of the term Yom HaMaseh in contrast to Rosh Chodesh, the day, of di- the day of doing in contrast to Rosh Chodesh to say the Rosh Chodesh is not a day on which you do deeds. And if I'm drawing that inference, I can say that in fact, the reason why is because of the Korban. People are busy with the korban. They're free from work to be busy with the korban. And what are they doing? Exactly what we saw on Sefer Yechezkel. They're coming to worship God. That's what you do on Rosh Chodesh. Let's take a second and stop, and let's do a thought experiment. When, when the Kuzari talks about Rosh Chodesh and a cycle being a monthly cycle as opposed to a weekly cycle, he talks about it being food for the soul. Now I want you to think about here in Israel or in America, wherever you are, in Canada as well, of course, to our own motion. Um, and I want you to think about what it would be like and if, it, if in addition to our Shabbatot, and for some of us our Sundays, once a month, there were an additional day on which we didn't perform labor. How would that affect our lives and the rhythm of our lives? We're not talking here about what we have already, which is that once every few months, a country might have a Labor Day or a Memorial Day or an Independence Day, and sort of at random every so often, we're getting a day off. What we're talking about here is the idea that you would have, as it were, a fixed monthly cycle upon which, in addition to your regular Shabbat, or even weekend, a fixed monthly cycle on which you wouldn't be doing work. How would that really be if we think back to the Kuzari, the same way we can readily see that that would be an added level of refreshment for the body or for our work, for our tiredness that would come on a regular basis. If we knew that on a monthly basis, we had an extra day that would affect our planning and our thinking because it would be so regular. Imagine also what that would do, again, for the soul. By the way, my understanding is actually that several decades ago, I'm not sure exactly when, there was a proposal made in Israel that every Rosh Chodesh should be a day off. 
It's kind of a fascinating thing to think about if it had come to fruition. And Radak seems to be describing something like that, an extra monthly day that's really dedicated to serving God and to recharging, to rejoicing and recharging, and not to malacha. Okay, now the question becomes, what happened to this custom? And if in fact, this custom in any way remains in effect. And what's funny is that the Talmudic evidence cuts in two directions. Here in source number 16, we have a description um, over the, it's a part of a description of, um, of, um, of uh, what is it? I'm sorry, I'm blocking. I'm blocking what the context is from Chagigai, forgive me. But what it says is, Rosh Chodesh Yochia, Rosh Chodesh is going to prove our point. Sheesh bo korban musaf, mutar basiyat mulacha. Rosh Chodesh is a day on which we have a korban musaf. At the same time, it's permissible to perform malacha. So based on this source in Chagiga, it seems very clear, even if it's a day of rejoicing, even if it's a day of bringing a korban, even if perhaps there might have been a custom at some point not to perform a lacha, performing lacha is permissible. In contrast to this, we have a source from Masechet Megillah, which is talking about, oh, I'm sorry, the source from, the source from Chagiga, I believe, is talking about Halal. Here, the source of Megillah is talking about Torah reading, how many aliyot we have for reading the Torah. And the source of Megillah is saying, Tashma, come and learn, Zeklal, this is the rule. Kol la'am, every day on which people, if they stayed longer in synagogue to read more of the Torah, would be missing work. Kigon tanit sibor v'tisha ba'av, korin gimel. I.e., the public fast day or tisha ba'av are days on which work is permissible. Because work is permissible on those days, if we would extend to fila by having an additional aliyah at shul beyond the three aliyot we typically have on a weekday, that would be drawing people away from the work in a way that would be difficult for them. And then the Talmud says, And a day on which people would not be missing work, such as Rosh Chodesh and Chol HaMoed, is a day in which you can read more of the Torah. You can have an additional Torah reading on Rosh Chodesh. So the additional, sorry, not additional Torah reading, an additional Aliyah on Rosh Chodesh, bringing us to four. And you can do that because having people be a little later in Shul is okay. It's okay for them to be a little later in Shul because they don't have to get back to do their work because they're not doing work on that day. The assumption here in Megillah is that people in fact, are not doing malacha on Rosh Chodesh. So we have a description talking about halal and why we don't say a full halal on Rosh Chodesh, which says that Rosh Chodesh is a day on which work is fully permissible. And we have a description about Torah reading and how many aliyot we have, which says that Rosh Chodesh is a day on which people aren't missing work if they're staying longer in shul. So this is sort of contradictory evidence. And the question becomes, really, bottom line, what's the story with doing work on Rosh Chodesh? And the answer actually has to do with women. Um, what we just read in last week's Parsha, talking about gifts for the Mishkan, talked about how the men and women were bringing their gifts. And what's significant is that when it discusses it, it says that the men brought their gifts al hanashim, in addition to the women. Here, however, in verse in the verses I brought in source number eighteen, we're talking about the sin of the golden calf. And when it comes to the sin of the golden calf, Aaron tells everyone to remove their jewelry, and tell to and he tells the men in particular to remove their wives' jewelry and the children's jewelry and to bring it for the golden calf, and the men actually take their own jewelry, and it doesn't say that they brought their wives' jewelry. Okay, so the Midrash is going to build on these traditions. Source number 19. The women heard that Aaron wanted to give the jewelry 
prochere egel, and they didn't consent. Rather, they said to them, you want to do something deplorable, abominable, and they didn't hear them. And God gave reward to women in this world and the next. And what's the reward? In this world, the reward is that women have a particular way of observing Rosh Chodesh. And the Abu Darham builds on this to explain why Rosh Chodesh would be the reward, source 22. And the Midrash says that because women were zealous to give to the Mishkan, for it says, the men came in addition to the women, i.e. the women gave first. The who come be'echad b'nisan, and the Mishkan was dedicated on the first of Nisan, which is Rosh Chodesh, and not just Rosh Chodesh, but the paradigmatic Rosh Chodesh, the first day of the first month. But in contrast, the women did not want to give their jewelry to the ego. In other words, the women showed clear discrimination. When it came to Chet HaEgel, they refused to give their jewelry. When it came to the Mishkan, they rushed to give their jewelry. For that reason, God gave women the reward of special observance of Rosh Chodesh. And he gave them that special reward because the Mishkan, where they were zealous to give, was dedicated on Rosh Chodesh. Okay, so women have the special reward. There's actually another idea about why women have a reward that's very beautiful, brought in Or Zarua. And soon we'll see how this all comes to help resolve the problem of the contradictory passages in the Talmud, or the seemingly contradictory passages in the Talmud. In the Or Zarua, it says, first he quotes the Midrash about women not giving to Chere Egel, and yes, contributing to the Mishkan. But then he adds something. He adds that the verse that's quoted at the end of, the Mish- of that Midrash is Titchadesh Kenesha Nuraychi, that your youth should be renewed like a Nesher. We usually translate this as eagle, though it's really a griffin vulture. Now, your youth shall be renewed. And he adds something additional to what we might think about the connection between women and Rosh Chodesh. Tedalacha, know you. Every month, a woman becomes sanctified and immerses and returns to her husband. And she becomes endeared to him like on the day of their wedding. Just like the moon is renewed every month. And everyone seeks to see her. In other words, the Orzarua adds that Rosh Chodesh is a fitting gift to women to observe it more carefully because women, like the moon, operate on a monthly cycle of renewal. How does that help resolve our issue in the Talmud? Well, Rashi says it's like this. We have one passage that says that we, perf- or that implies at least, that we perform Malacha and Rosh Chodesh. And we have another passage that says, we can add a fourth aliyah on Rosh Chodesh like we would in Cholamod because we don't do all malacha. It sounds like it's like Cholamod, where there's many malachot that we refrain from doing. Well, Rashi says, what's the difference? She'en hanashim osot malacha bahem. Specifically, women are not doing malacha on Rosh Chodesh. And then he explains in terms of Cheda Egel. In other words, for women, the tradition was not to do malacha on Rosh Chodesh. And for that reason, there was the ability to have an additional aliyah in the Torah reading, which suggests that women were attending the Torah reading, perhaps. Uh, the Chida says that um, uh, for every Rosh Chodesh. Whereas for men, they didn't have a custom necessarily, at least not after the time, perhaps, of the Korban of refraining from work on Rosh Chodesh. What it sounds like is that, as we know, the Torah does not say that Rosh Chodesh is a day on which work is prohibited. 
It does not make that explicit. The same way that it doesn't make it explicit when it comes to Chol Moed. However, we know that Rosh Chodesh was compared to Shabbat, and it was compared to the festivals, and it's a day of rejoicing. So it seems that, especially in conjunction with the Korban, there was a widespread custom to refrain from labor on Rosh Chodesh and to occupy oneself with Avodah Hashem, as Yechezkel describes. However, what was maintained from that custom, and where it's not just a custom, perhaps something even stronger than custom, is when it comes to women. Because women have the special merit of a reward of Rosh Chodesh as a result of not giving their jewelry for Chet Egel. And in fact, Tosfot does use a stronger language than Rashi. He says, women are absolutely prohibited from doing work on Rosh Chodesh. Rashi said, Rashi just said, women don't do melacha on Rosh Chodesh. They don't do labor on Rosh Chodesh. Tosfot are saying, it's asur, it's prohibited for women to perform melacha on Rosh Chodesh. So Rosh Chodesh maintains that identity of being a day on which one wouldn't do labor, specifically through the practice of women. And in fact, this is a practice that was kept up to some degree, one degree or another. And what I want to look at as we start to draw what we do to a close is what the Be'or Halacha, this is the Mishnah Brura, has to say about what the Halacha Lama says is, what the practical Halacha is. And then I want to take this and I want to go back to our broader theme about Rosh Chodesh and its identity. What does he say? Source 31. Shekol isha tzricha lekabel aleha min hagzeh. Every woman must take upon herself this practice when it comes to labor on Rosh Chodesh, performing labor on Rosh Chodesh. Hainu deina resha'a al kol panim lasot yom zeh kechom amash. That a woman certainly is not permitted to treat Rosh Chodesh as if it's a day of chol, as if it's a regular day. Lasok b'chol melachot to be occupied with all kinds of labors. This is a mitzvah for women from early days not to perform malach on Rosh Chodesh. For men, it was a custom that has fallen into disuse. This doesn't mean that a woman can't do any type of malacha. It just is a question of not making it like a day of chol. Not doing any type of halacha of malacha depends on her custom. If from when she grew up, she had the custom of doing at least some malachot on Rosh Chodesh, then it's not a prohibition for her to do malacha on Rosh Chodesh. She's not commanded in this. Women had varying customs. Even in ancient days, some people did some days. And there are people who didn't do any. What does this mean in practice? It means women, when it comes to Rosh Chodesh, are supposed to find at least one malacha, at least one way in which they're distinctly making a difference between their experience of Rosh Chodesh and a day of Chol. That's the remnant of the idea that Rosh Chodesh too would be a day on which we're not performing malacha. Okay, I'm gonna come back to our screen here. Let's see if I can stop the share. I wanna bring back together different strands. Oh, I see, I have a question, let me see. Is the sin that of physical limitation that even God cannot satisfy everyone? That's fascinating. Um, this is going back to the Gemara in Chulin and the Agadita. What is the nature if there were to be a sin of God's sin? I don't think we're actually saying it was a sin. I think God is giving more of a nod because we can't really say that God sinned, but he's bringing the offering and, this not, and it's not so much a physical limitation, but that in some level, he accepted the moon's claim that, not in, the, that in the world, just as on high, there can only be one God and not two gods, in the world as well, there can only be one and not two. And perhaps that means that not everyone can be satisfied, but perhaps it means that really this offering is ultimately met, what God means to give or to extend to the moon in order to satisfy him. Okay, coming back, bringing us back to what we've looked at, what have we seen? We've seen that Rosh Chodesh is a day of rejoicing. It's a day with a special sacrifice. 
It's a day that Yechezkel envisions as being one even in the future on which everyone gathers and spends the day worshiping God. It's a day on which, at least at the time of Korbanot being offered, was celebrated with feasting and with refraining from performing labor. It was not Yom HaMaaseh. And even today, there's a remnant of that in terms of women's practice or observance of Rosh Chodesh as a special day, which should find expression in refraining from at least one type of labor. Um, a typical one is women not doing laundry on Rosh Chodesh, um, though technically it's not perhaps a labor in this context. Some women just don't make dinner. They go out for dinner. That doesn't necessarily satisfy the specific custom, but that's all, it's another thing to look at. But where, where, what are we really saying? And what's really the tension that's coming out in the halachic discussion of what the expression of not performing labor on Rosh Chodesh is? The tension that's coming out is that it's really hard to connect to Rosh Chodesh as the spiritual resource that Kuzari envisions when we're not at the same time refraining from performing malacha. Our natural way to connect to a day is a day of sanctity or is a day that is special for seeking out God and not our usual earthly occupations is refraining from performing malacha. And that's not the chief way in which Rosh Chodesh is characterized, even to the extent that that finds expression throughout history and in halacha in practice, it's a practice and not a formal prohibition. And even for women, to the extent there might be a formal prohibition, it's limited in scope. And there's a tension here between recognizing a day as a special day, finding within it a spiritual resource, and at the same time, in some ways, going about our normal business. And the Kuzari himself seemed to suggest, and certainly the Shunami, talking about going the special day you go to see the man of God, seemed to suggest that Rosh Chodesh shouldn't be experienced in that way. It should be experienced as something different. Well, what I want to share with you, and I think it has implications not just for how we think about Rosh Chodesh, but perhaps even for how we're thinking about religious observance in the time of Corona, is a passage by Rav Soloveitchik. I apologize. I don't have it printed out on the screen. Um, I'm going to have to read it to you. It's a passage that comes from an essay that he wrote called Beseter of Galui, from a book called Divrei Hagut Beharacha. I see it's coming out backwards on the screen. Um, and Beseter of Galui already tells you something about the theme of the piece. And hiding, Seter of Galui, and revealed. What's hidden and what is revealed. And here, I'm sure most of you have heard of the idea that Rav Soloveitchik developed of the halachic man, Ish Halacha, and of the idea he developed of the man of faith, the lonely man of faith, Isha Emunah Habuded. Here, Rav Soloveitchik introduces even another character. He calls him the Ish Rosh Chodesh, where the Ish Rosh Chodesh is someone who's deeply connected and engrossed and involved in worshiping God, and yet somehow is not wearing that on his sleeve. And in the course of describing the Ish Rosh Chodesh, and I want to thank my friend Ulana Sodeman Silverman for helping me um, understand the significance of this piece. In the course of describing the significance of Ish Rosh Chodesh, Rosaloveitchik talks about Rosh, what Rosh Chodesh means as a whole. So I'm reading here from page 185, a section called Rosh Chodesh Mativo. Rosh Chodesh, what is its nature? Hayadut Mamina. Judaism believes in the ability of renewal, of new things and of renewal. Levana, back to the moon. Levana she'ora hichvir v'halach ad shenelma me'en ro'im. The moon, whose light grew pale and slowly faded away till it disappeared from the eyes of those who could behold it. Chozer to mufia be'ofek. What happens on Rosh Chodesh? The light that disappeared slowly emerges on the horizon. And the person awaits the moon. He knows that the moon is going to return and appear at its appointed time. small, pale, thin as a string of silver. But its light is going to grow. And it's going to move forward until it's going to keep growing until it reaches its fullness. 
כשאדם רואה את הלבנה החדשה, when man sees the new moon, הרי הוא מכריז, behold he announces, declares, מקודש, מקודש, it's sanctified, it's sanctified, הוא חוגג את ראש חודש, and he celebrates ראש חודש. ראש חודש מסמל את האמונה בנחמה הקרובה לבוא. ראש חודש symbolizes belief in the comfort that's soon to come. בהתחדשות מתוך התנוונות, in renewal from within, diminishing, בזריחת האור מתוך לעבוד שקיעה, in the shining of light from within, the flames of sunset, בתחייה מתוך גביעה, of life from within depth. כנסת ישראל לפעמים מתבוססת בדמה ומפרפרת מתוך ייסורים על אנושיים. There have been times when the people of Israel have had to face so beyond what humans can bear of suffering. מידת הדין מתוחה בחללו של עולם when the attribute, God's attribute of judgment is stretched out across the expanse of the world, חרב ושומם, and the world seems to be full of destruction. האדם יושב ופניו כבושות במציאות אכזרית. A person sits and he's, he's crushed facing this very cruel and difficult reality. עתיד אחור וקודר מהלך עליו פחדים, a future of ugliness, something frightful comes upon him. בא ראש חודש ומנחמו. ראש חודש appears and it comforts him. מוחה את דמעתו מעל פניו, ראש חודש itself comes and wipes the tear from his face. היש הלב ביקם, הישועה קרובה לבוא. Redemption is near. פגימת הישות ההיסטורית תתמלא, the diminishing, the, 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 the problem the, of, of, of what's happening in history, don't worry, it will be replenished. כמו שמתמלאת פגימתה של הלבנה, just as the moon's diminishing is replenished. אמת, it's true, עוד אתמול חרב הכל ונאחר הכל, even yesterday everything seemed to be destroyed and ugly. אמת, עוד אתמול הוצתו יישובי ישראל באש, Just yesterday, the settlements of Israel were destroyed in flame. Emet, zelok far shaka or, it's true that just recently the light seemed to sink, v'nelam ha'yarech, and the moon disappeared, v'lel choshech ofif et akol, and a dark night came upon everything. Avarei, but look, see, hine levana nugao tsnua ola e shama al pnei ha'ofek od pam. There's a small, little moon coming there on the horizon. It's coming out again. Umitoch karnei orah ha'dakim, and from within the small, slight rays of light from the moon, nirehet ha'shchina, we see the divine presence. Bi'egona ha'ilim, in its silent sorrow for us, ברחמיה הרבים, in its great mercy, ובאהבתה האינסופית, and with its unending love, לוחש לנו, and it whispers, ראש חודש whispers to us, לוחש לנו ראש חודש, בסורת גאולה, the tiding of the redemption, וישועה מתוך חורבן, there's going to be salvation from within the destruction. ראש חודש tells us there's תקווה ותנחומים מתוך אבלות. There is hope and comfort to come from within mourning. Binyan mitoch heres, there's building to come from within destruction. V'chaye oz mitoch dam ve'esh, strong life to come from within blood and fire. B'chinat b'damay chayi, like the verse in Yechezkel says, that by your blood you will live. Rosh Chodesh mesamel et hamilui mitoch hapgima. Rosh Chodesh symbolizes the replenishment the fullness from, that we can see even within what is diminished, and the revelation from within what is hidden. This is our moment. What I want to say, putting the pieces together, is that Rosh Chodesh indeed, in some ways, is a holiday in disguise. It's a day of rejoicing and worshiping God. It's a day in which some of us have maintained some customs of not doing work, but at the same time, it comes at us not in a very blatant, clear, clear way. In some ways, it's very much like the moon, the moon which was diminished, the moon which is not always realized in its wholeness. And God, on some level, pointing to this, is saying to us that Rosh Chodesh is the festival on which we recognize 
that at the darkest times, redemption is always sure to come. That even if something wanes in the future, it's going to wax. Rosh Chodesh is the holiday that within the time when it's hardest to seek Kedusha, we have to find a way within still being occupied in what is difficult for us or in our daily occupations, still within that, we have to find a way to understand that God, even there, is revealing himself to us. And I think indeed that if we can experience Rosh Chodesh in that way, if we can, it really will be spiritual nourishment, just as the Kuzari envisioned. Thank you very much. If anyone has a question, please type it on the chat or you can feel free to unmute. Otherwise, we're gonna give a five minute break before the next year. Um, for those of you who might be interested, I'm just typing in here, I have address of the site that I work on where there's a full article that details some of the things that were in the shiur, though it does not include the piece by Rav Soloveitchik. Rav Soloveitchik's piece, again, is called the Seter of Galui, and it appears in his Ivrei Hagut Ha'aracha, in case you want to find it. Thank you so much for joining us today.